Hi, and welcome to DESI 612. Today we're going to wrap up this course um, by really talking about strategic thinking and strategy. And uh, specifically, we're going to dig in by first defining what strategy is. And, and essentially, as you can see from this definition, uh, a couple of different definitions, um, an elaborate and systematic plan of action. And from a military perspective, the branch of military science dealing with military command and the planning and conduct of a war. Common thing is the development of a plan. It's looking at what is it you're trying to accomplish and then putting a plan together to accomplish it. And that's essentially the essence of strategy. So the real question is, what is the plan? There are so many different choices in so many different directions. And let's link this up to leadership a little bit. <clears throat> Think about the difference between a manager and a leader. A manager is all about planning and controlling. A leader is about setting a direction and a vision. Now, a lot of times they're kind of combined together. But the reason I make that distinguishment and that choice is because of, you know, as people that work for other folks, and even if we're in a top tier position or even if we have our own company, um, we're still working for other folks if you think about it. We're working for our customers, we're working for our employees, we're working for other people that count on us for our sheer existence, whether it's our family or other things. But one of the things that we're also counted on, whether it's based on our department, whether it's just our own work unit, our own workload, or if we are in one of those ultimate leadership roles, it's setting direction. It's making some choices about which direction we're going to go in. You know, think about it if you're out hiking. Are we going to go north, south, east, west, or somewhere in between? And that's the essence of strategic planning, making choices. Now, you know, if you're out hiking and you see a steep cliff and you're not a rock climber and you're not well prepared to be, become a rock climber or you don't have the equipment, even if you are a rock climber, then maybe trying to go over that cliff, climb up that cliff and go over it does not make any sense. Maybe it's better to look at alternatives. So we've got to make choices. We have to put it in a context, and we have to make choices based on what we understand about that context. So you have to ask yourself, and one, this is a place that I like to start with strategic planning, is you know, start thinking about your own direction, your own direction in life. Who are you? you know, what are your strengths? What do you bring to the table? You know, I typically um, don't overemphasize weaknesses because weaknesses, if we focus too much on weaknesses and we're not focused on either negating those weaknesses, eliminating those weaknesses, or overcoming those weaknesses, then they'll hold us back. They become barriers in our mind as to what we can't do. So I think it's important to focus on strengths and what we can do. And then also, if we do have weaknesses that are important for us to overcome or negate or to um, strengthen somehow, then we've got to find a way to do that. <clears throat> so I start by saying, who are you? You know, it's sort of taking a personal inventory. Where are you going? In other words, do you have a sense of direction? And do you have some idea of how you'll get there? You know, if we're hiking, we're going to get there typically by foot. Now, you know, what do we need to do that? Well, we need a decent pair of shoes probably to start with. Um, and so, you know, there's just little action items or little tactics that come into mind that are important to help us get where we want to go. So when you're talking about developing a strategy, it implies direction, knowing where we're going to go, some kind of action, and then in our minds or in other means, putting together some kind of plan so that we can accomplish those actions that allow us to um, realize the direction that we're trying to head in. From a business point of view, although I guess you could personalize this too, we have a number of different tools that we use. We might take a, an assessment of or make an assessment of our current state. What do we have currently? What's in our inventory or what assets do we have? What's our relative position? Uh, again, from a business point of view, relative to the market, competition as well as demand and customers. Customers in particular, even more than competition. Um, how about the products that we might have or the services? You know, are they growth oriented or are they mature? Are they in the state of decline, etc.? What are we really, really good at? And then what kind of cash do we have, including cash flow? And then get into classical things like SWOT analysis, strength, weakness, opportunities, and threats, looking at internal and externalities of the situation, 
Um, you can also broaden this and get into political, economic, societal, technological, PEST or PESTAL and STEEPLE and some of the other acronyms that are out there related to this kind of analysis. And, you know, it is a good idea to go through even at a surface level evaluation of looking at many, many different things so that you get a good sense and a feel for the opportunity as you move forward. Another approach that's very popular is that you've, I'm sure, been exposed to is Michael Porter's Five Forces model. And this is where, you know, you look at things from supply chain perspective. Um, you know, who's got the strength within the supply chain? Um, you know, or do you have high demand kind of products? Think of Apple in this context. Apple, you know, has very high demand kind of products and their prices tend to reflect that. Um, and so they've got, you know, the strength and they've got the bargaining power with customers and they've got the bargaining power with suppliers for the most part. You know, over time, historically, these things do change. You know, Apple had, had, was in a similar position at one point with computers um, for a very brief moment in time. Also, what about new entrants or substitute products? Um, you know, so you've always got to be sort of scanning and kind of understanding what's going on with technology, with trends. Um, you know, this day and age with globalization being the way it is and the ability for information to move very rapidly from one place to another and therefore products and services to move very rapidly from one place to another. Um, you know, it's important to also understand what's going on there. Okay, and you know, then generic Porter also developed a concept of generic strategies, whether it's a uh, low cost or, um, you know, broad industry wide, sorry, broad industry wide, um, is your scope and whether you're in a low cost position, you have cost leadership or product uniqueness. I'll argue that, you know, cost leadership is a very, very difficult position to maintain over a long period of time in a global economy. Um, you know, there are just too many things going on that, um, shift sometimes very subtly, but sometimes very significantly the margins and, um, the uh, profitability of a given product category. And so, um, if you think about commodities and that kind of stuff, um, you know, the weather can, can affect things, uh, delays in deliveries of items can affect things. I mean, think about what happens if a container ship gets held up an extra week or so trying to go through the, um, Panama Canal, for example, either due to weather or some technological issue or backlog or whatever, um, you know, that one week may force um, people to start air freighting items in at a huge cost disadvantage just to satisfy some customer needs. And so, you know, you might, in a normal, stable, everything is just fine kind of environment, you might be able to assume cost leadership for a long period of time, but the truth is nothing is ever that way. So, and there's lots of competition that's trying to come in to undercut you in a variety of different ways. So I think differentiation strategy, value add, finding, as we'll talk about later on, the blue oceans, those areas where there's not as much competition are is an often more difficult but more rewarding way to go in the long run key question that you always come back to is how do we add value such that people want to buy from us and not somebody else. If you look at a narrow market segment or a niche, you may have a very focused strategy um, and you deliver exactly what the customer wants at a price that they want, or you could also have a focused strategy that is oriented towards differentiation. So value add or cost, these are the two things. One drives revenue and uh, profit margins up, and the other one drives um, revenue and profit margins down, but both can be winning strategies if you've got a good handle on uh, the approach that you're taking. I'm not going to go through this in a great deal, um, but you can look it up online. They're generic strategies and industry focus. Um, and you see, you know, if you look at the, uh, in the left hand corner, what you've got are the industry forces, you've got the five forces laid out. For us over here, you've got uh, the two different uh, cost leadership and differentiation generic strategies, as Porter calls it, also here. And then some suggestions on, you know, what the manufacturer or supplier can do that allows them to be in a better position. So, for example, um, where you have a cost leadership position 
and uh, relative to, whoops, I'm sorry, firepower. Um, you know, you may, if to powerful buyers, you may offer them a lower price, so you may have a discounting strategy related to um, the relative position of the buyers. On the other hand, if large buyers don't have as much power to negotiate because of few close alternatives, then that puts you in a better position. And um, so your focus may be on you know, finding those large buyers that have less power to negotiate because of a few alternatives. You know, here's a thought on that. Let's assume that you've got two or three buyers that are competing with each other. One is in a more dominant position. You know, why not focus your efforts on, um, and, and that number one, because of their position in the market, you know, may in fact be um, trying to uh, leverage their number one position and, and literally uh, beat you over a head, so to speak, to get the best prices possible. So they may be trying to get you away from your differentiation strategy and instead trying to um, negotiate a deal where they can uh, buy from you at a lower price. Well, why not ignore number one and go after number two and number three? Um, number two and number three may, in fact, um, be willing to pay more money and combined may be willing to, you know, you may be able to get just as much um, sales out of them but at a higher margin and therefore make more profits if you focus on them because they have a little less power so they're not going to be able to negotiate. They're going to be a little hungrier to get your differentiable product um, and, and if you think this isn't an actuality, well, all you have to do is look at the um, market for mobile phones in the U.S. to realize that Apple negotiated, I believe it was with um, AT&T or Verizon first before they allowed any of the other manufacturers to um, get their products. And so they chose one of the two main competitors <laughs> in the market with to work with and uh, this put them in a position where they could um, you know negotiate a more favorable level because AT&T I think it was really really wanted the iPhone whatever the first generation was and uh, in return they had some kind of exclusive arrangement for a few months that gave them an immediate competitive advantage in our market and it wasn't until a few months later that Verizon was able to get the product. So, you know, those kind of things do go on. So, going back to um, the generic uh, strategies, you know, the focus for low cost is obviously on cost. Um, the features have to meet a minimum set, but it's all about cost at the end of the day once, once those minimum features have been met. And then, at the bottom end of the market, <coughs> where you may have high volume economies of scale, specific commodities, as I referred to before, again, cost is the driving factor. Uh, people don't really pay attention to brand and that kind of stuff nearly to the same degree because they're buying in volume and, and you know every penny saved when you're buying millions of units or something is profit that goes to your bottom line. So it's important. On the other hand, differentiation and product uniqueness the focus is on value add, and so you're really trying to find um, the combination of factors, including combinations or bundles of products and services that make you stand out, that go beyond the customer's immediate need, maybe even help the customers sell their products and market their products in a way that differentiates them from their competition. So lots of interesting stuff. So going back to Michael Porter's Five Forces model, you know, questions um, about building entry barriers, about minimizing customer power, or minimizing supplier power. From your point of view as the company, what can you do to put yourself in the best position possible? That's really the key thing. Now let's look briefly at the value framework, and this is creating a, your, your competitive advantage over a period of time or sustainability. Um, again, we cycle back to this concept of adding value starts by looking at the features of what you have to offer, but then it gets into the benefits of offering um, you know, these features in a way that fulfills the customer's needs. Um, at the end of the day, what you're offering has to be worth it to the customer. The customer has to perceive 
that what you're offering truly does add value to their situation or to their application. It's the customer who decides, it's not us. And that's why you have to be careful about just complying with minimal standards um, that are published out there. Because any those standards really represent barriers to the market. Or another way to put it is they are the minimum set of requirements that give you access to the market. Beyond that, though, the customer is going to say, okay, you know, I want to know how buying your product makes me a better company and ultimately makes me more profits, if you will, either by reducing costs or increasing my revenue. Um, I want to understand that. I want to know how that works. So if you want to be a value marketer, then you've got to figure out what the customer's need is as a minimum. Obviously, offer products that perform. Um, find out ways that you can give more than the customer expects. Um, you know, give guarantees, but guarantees that are meaningful. So if the product does not actually work, um, you know, be, be swift and without contrition on um, taking care of the issue. Your pricing has to be realistic. That doesn't mean it has to be cheap or at, at market level. It can be higher than market level. But people need to be able to say, yes, if I buy from you, I am truly getting the best value. Not necessarily the best price, but the best value. In other words, your bundles of products and services at the price that you're selling them for um, are worth it. Um, you have to um, make sure that the customer understands the facts of the situation, strong relationships, and um, based on uh, trust and respect. In other words, what you're aiming to do is differentiate yourself from the competition. You want to be their most valued business partner. And this goes back to my earlier comment of finding blue oceans. You know, a blue ocean, you don't have real competition um, because you found a way to differentiate yourself through uh, your bundle of products and services. Um, and this allows you to create and capture new market demand. Okay, so you're getting away from just a price discussion. You're talking about a value discussion. In a red ocean, it's all about price and beating the competition. And it can get, it, it, you know, it's red. The analogy is red because it gets bloody. Um, you may not make much profit. You know, I'll give you two situations. Um, when I was running an electronic controls high-tech group in uh, North Carolina back in the 90s, two different opportunities, one that actually led to the other. Um, there was a company called Marley Cooling Towers, one of the largest cooling tower manufacturers in the United States. And they contacted us because, as they understood it, we were making our products in the U.S. and they wanted to be made in America capability. And that was partially true, but um, our future products were going to be somewhat made in the U.S., but also made in France and Singapore. So things were changing a little bit. I couldn't guarantee that full well, made in the U.S., but one of the things that I did is once I understood their needs, I could sit down with them and then at least once a year, often twice a year, we would get together and plan uh, you know, how to support their marketing strategy. And this included uh, them including our logo on their brochures um, because they saw value in our brand. Um, it included uh, you know, sitting down and looking at the market opportunities that they were going to push and promote and us making sure that we provided them with the information, allowed them to be do that successfully. It also you know, meant assigning a dedicated uh, product support person who went out there at least once a year to meet with their product support team to do some training. Um, so there were some additional value-added kind of things that we did <coughs> that allowed us to capture that business against some very stiff competition. And I believe we got it at a slight premium, maybe three, four percentage points uh, higher than... Uh, our tough competition because of the non-product related value add. Now, we got that one and we went after another company called Train, which is a huge HVAC company. And um, the first company, Marley, represented maybe a million and a half dollars a year in what we call OEM, original equipment manufacturer kind of sales. Well, Train represented $15 million a year potentially. I think that was our year five value that we realized. But train, um, you know, we tried to add in some of those all those value added um, items. But at the end of the day, I remember the final round of negotiations was just whacking prices, um, led by one of our senior VPs who I reported to, 
um, just to get the volume. So it went from a attempt at being value add to, you know, cutting our prices almost randomly. And, um, you know, I was scrambling to make sense out of it all. And, you know, I don't think it was really profitable per se, although it gave us tremendous volume and it gave us access to a piece of the market that we normally did not have a lot of success in. So at the end of the day, it might have been a, a reasonable business decision, but it was certainly um, a very competitive, price-driven um, negotiation at the end of the day. Whereas the other one, we got away from price and we focused on value because of the additional marketing support, customer support, some of those other things that, you know, we promised them and then delivered on and, you know, we ended up having a good three-year relationship with them. So some of the key questions to ask is, you know, when you're talking about Blue Ocean, but what can we stop doing that the industry has always taken for granted? What factors can be reduced well below the industry standard? In other words, maybe maybe the industry standard is, is not really relevant. Um, what can we do that goes above and beyond the industry standard? And then are there other factors that can be created that the industry has never offered? So this is what we call you know, our blue ocean strategy. We want to look at those things that we can reduce or eliminate and those things that we can increase, raise, or create to come up with the right value proposition. Let's look at a couple of tangible examples. First in wine sector. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Yellowtail, but a very um, popular wine here in the U.S. Now some of the classical factors related to the wine industry are um, wine yard prestige or the label. Um, used to be French wines of course were the preeminent wines globally. Um, to some extent, they still are, but they have a ton of competition these days. Um, the complexity of the wine, whatever that means, as well as the range of wine. Um, the level of marketing communications or sophistication of the communications. Um, the above-the-line marketing, um, really label, uh, positioning in uh, store shelves, that kind of stuff. Factors related to aging. And then, of course, price position in the market. And, you know, for each of these, we can probably think of examples. But if we apply these to what's called the Blue Ocean Strategy Canvas, and we look at the four actions framework, the eliminate, reduce, create, and raise, well, what you're trying to do is come up with a new value curve. So um, in the case of uh, this small vineyard out of Australia, Yellowtail, they didn't have wine yard prestige. No one had ever really heard of them outside of Australia. They didn't really have, they couldn't claim complexity. You know, again, prestige and complexity probably go to some extent hand in hand, but they didn't have the notoriety or the reputation or the wins, if you will, and a lot of um, international um, wine tasting competitions to be able to claim. They didn't necessarily have the range of wines either. So they needed to find a way to make those factors less significant to their to the market. Okay, and the market is not sommeliers. The market is customers, people that would actually buy their wine. They need they wanted to eliminate some of the um, expenses associated with communication. Again, they're a small vineyard, so they couldn't spend a lot of time on their marketing, a lot of money on their marketing efforts. Not the tens of millions, if not more, that they would need to get the kind of growth they were looking for. They also didn't have um, necessarily any kind of advantages related to aging quality. Again, they're a small vineyard, um, and so you know not a lot to go by that would feed into just a, this reputation. So they needed to create a new value curve, and the way they did that was by making their product an easy one to select because it was a good product, and to play off of their location from um, Australia. Uh, you know, which sort of has a fun and adventurous uh, reputation. And then they actually also bumped their price up a little bit. So they created a new value curve is what we call it. And they got away from being, you know, previously they had been a moderately priced, um, their value curve previously was the yellow right here, okay, this middle line. So they had, you know, been a value priced, a higher than the budget lines, okay, 
So they were positioned slightly above the budget lines, but that can be kind of a miserable territory, to be honest with you, especially if nobody really knows because they're going to be comparing me to budget lines. Um, they didn't have a lot of the other factors that premium wines had, so they couldn't really charge for that. But what they could do is they could redefine things. And what they decided to do is position themselves as the, um, essentially the good generic table wine. You know, they're easy to drink, they're highly visible, and they're fun and adventurous. And their labels are very, very straightforward. They play off of that fun and adventurous thing. When you see it, it's a simple label. There's nothing on it about dates or, you know, other kinds of things that, um, you know, the more sophisticated or people that think they're sophisticated wine drinkers might look for. So um, they redefined the market, if you will. And pushing up their price was a little, you know, was a part of it. Let me go back to this for a second. You know, where they started showing up in the U.S. maybe 12, 15 years ago was in supermarkets. So instead of being in wine shops, they were in supermarkets. And they put their big push on, on being, you know, on end caps where they stood out and offering their bottles of red or white for like $6.99 a bottle. So, you know, maybe five euros a piece. So that's, you know, sort of a mid-range or low end of the range. It's not, not mid-range, but it's a low end um, table wine. But that makes it accessible to a lot, a lot of people who aren't necessarily sophisticated in their taste. And so if you're just looking for a good, inexpensive bottle of wine, and you're not very sophisticated in your taste, and you buy Yellowtail, well, what they wanted is they wanted people to try it, taste it, if they liked it, to come back and buy more of it because it was a reliable and easy to um, recognize uh, product. You know, I get confused by labels. I know certain, because of my time in the south of France, there's certain um, Appalachian controles that I'm very familiar with in regions, but, you know, otherwise um, not a very sophisticated wine drinker. So if I find a label that I like and it's easy to recognize and the price is reasonable, then I'm going to drink more of it. And that was basically Yellowtail's approach. So they redefined the way in which people bought wines. And they were very, 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 very successful. They may be, be, even been able to push their prices up over time. So it's a good example. Another example is Cirque du Soleil. We're all familiar, I think, with Cirque du Soleil. But, you know, how they competed against a traditional circus. You know, look at some of the key factors for a traditional circus. Fun and humor, thrill and danger, star performers, animal shows, um, concession sales in the aisles and uh, three ring circus or multiple show arenas you know and the location is also a factor well they couldn't compete on all those things so they had to reduce some of the fun and humor and the thrill and danger they got rid of having star performers or animals um, also concession sales and multiple show arenas they had to come up with sort of a unique approach and also create different themes a more refined environment um, they ultimately ended up creating multiple productions and made it a little more artistic with their music and dance. So again, they de-emphasized some of the things that made circuses so famous for over 100 years and emphasized certain other capabilities and uh, really redefined circuses today. So we have two different types of circuses. Cirque du Soleil kind of circus, which is more about entertainment, um, artistic entertainment with a theme, versus the traditional circuses and more about animal shows and um, thrill and danger. Now as we start to taper down to um, kind of pulling this together a bit, remember what Peter Drucker said about the two primary functions of business. First of all, marketing and secondly, innovation. And he says that everything else is a cost. So if you want to be successful, go back to what, you know, Porter said about your strategies and think in particular about value add and about differentiating yourself and about blue oceans. You know, part of it is getting the word out there and stimulating demand and getting people excited about what you have to offer. And part of it is about constantly coming up with new ways to do things, whether it's to market your products, think about social media, okay? Think about Twitter and Facebook and, you know, the era that we live in or even ourselves with LinkedIn. Um, you know, or about process, you know, how we do things, think about drive throughs and that sort of stuff, or um, new inventions that lead to great innovations. Uh, think about 3D printing, which is not new, about 30 years old, but still about how it represents a potential for disrupting um, manufacturing. So strategy should be based on how you create customers 
and then how you can also be different than everyone else. And this is where marketing and innovation fit in. And operations contributions? Well, operations is responsible for ensuring consistent quality. So think about process management and control, some of the topics that we've talked about as we've gone through this course over the last few months. Also about adding value um, through the conversion of inputs and outputs, and also the elimination of waste. And then it's also a source of innovation, process and product. So the key thing is ask how will you differentiate yourself from the competition. Weak differentiations related to quality, customer orientation, creativity, price, breadth of line. These are things that other people do. Okay, Strong differentiation has to do with owning things or being first, being in a leadership position. Um, heritage. You know, Maybe you've got a length of history. I've seen that in higher education. We're a 136-year-old institution, and that is starting to pay off in terms of uh, competitive advantage versus some of the newer firms. Um, do you have specializations? Um, how do you treat your customer? Possibly how your product is made, where it's made, um, lateness or hotness of what you've got. So at the end of the day, you have to go back to what's the purpose of business. Remember, it's not about profits. It's about creating customers. And again, this is a Peter Drucker concept. The profit is a necessary condition required to reward shareholders and maintain a competitive advantage through innovation and marketing. But at the end of the day, you have to create customers. They've got to be satisfied with what you have to offer and be willing to pay for it. So to wrap up, operations is about adding value. Without value, you can't create customers. It's the source of what the business sells, the source of profits. It's about understanding flows, IT, communications, material is critical to the understanding of business. Quality management and a philosophy of continuous movement are best practices, and the use of uh, data and information is critical to managing, planning, and controlling your business. And with that, we are finished.